basically a shortened version of what they presented there on behalf of the project. And that was reciting some other talks by Andy Connolly, who is our in-house photosee expert. Now I just realized if I got smarter, I should have put a link to all the talks from that workshop. But hopefully if you Google something like this, photosee, Schmidt, and Pittsburgh, and 2016, you'll get something. If not, I'll find it later and I can mail it to everyone. There were about 20 talks at that meeting, and the main outcome of that meeting is about two, three pages of recommendations to the desk group. What, is the, what are the top priorities for them to do, as well as some recommendations for the project particular to data management team about the data products related to fundamental questions that we would be delivering. And that part is described in data products, the definition document. By now I suppose you're all familiar with that document. But if not, go to ls.st slash dp dp data products definition document. And you will have an up-to-date description of all the quantity the data management will compute for you and that you will be using to do your science. Jeff, can you repeat the your ls.st, that's our standard URL shortener, slash dptd, d as in Detroit, t as in Portsmouth.
summary of what LSST is. And I'm showing it here because I want to, to draw your attention to the fact that there are maybe a dozen numbers, numerical values in this slide. And these numerical values bear a result of some design process that took some inputs and then decided that we need about 1,000 visits in 10 years, that we will get 2.5 million images. So that's a result of design process that started with broad science themes. We have four <coughs> main science themes that come in many flavors. And those science themes driven, have driven the properties of the system that are described on the left hand side. Of course, we cannot control the atmosphere yet, but we need to take it into account. And then the other three we were designing. And it's very easy to drive yourself crazy when you look at this, because each science program can have principle, at least in principle, impact on each property of the system. And each tiny property of the system, like CCD, Eureka, or vibrations of the telescope, or pick any you want, can then also have impact on many science programs. So you have many to many mapping, and then if you want to optimize design, it's very easy to get into this back and forth optimization loop where you don't convert. So what we did was to specify the system in terms of data properties. So to speak in a simplified way, I'm a scientist, I'm an astronomer, I'm going to do some science, I say, I really don't care if your telescope was 8 meters or 16 meters. I really don't care how big your field of view was. What I care about is that I have fully sampled in atmospheric scene, fully sampled image of this time, at least over half the sky to this limiting depth. And then, how do you get there? Well, we have individual images, they have some sample functions and so on. But the main point is that we are describing in our requirements the properties of these images, the data properties. And then going between system and data properties, that's job of our systems engineering. And going from data properties to science and back, that's the job for our scientists, astronomers, physicists, for the whole science community. And that's how we manage to handle this complex optimization process, which has been quite stable over the last 10 years. We didn't change the system much after the initial design. And the SRD, the Science Requirements Document, which in a sense is the constitution of the LSSD, that's the highest design document. In SRD, the data properties in, in the first part are specified very precisely, but then when we specify sampling functions, how, in other words, how we will deploy the system, that is much more loose if you look at the last section of the SRD. And because we are not specifying any science programs, we are also not specifying explicitly for the Z. We don't say you must have vibrations of the system below that many degrees per second, or the first mode, first IBM mode of telescope has to be below that many hertz because we want to get photo Z to that position. That's the couple. We specify data properties, but the properties of this data were driven by photo Z requirements, which themselves were driven by dark energy task force figure of merit and so on. So, now let me zoom in and just focus on one particular aspect of the system, which is filter complement and one particular driver for filter com complement, and that's photometric pressures. So the basic quantity for such a uniform survey you need to decide on is the exposure time. And that exposure time has direct impact on several other very important scientific quantities. The first one is the limiting depth of a single image that's M5. The second one, which is important for time domain science, is the revisit time. How many days does it take until you return to the same spot on the sky? That's, of course, very important for time domain. And then, if you integrate that over 10 years, how many observations of a given spot on the sky do you get over 10 years? And these depend on, on the exposure time that you choose. And it's interesting, actually, the system was designed that way that the requirements are compatible between vastly different science cases. And we get the optimal exposure time to be in the range of about 20 to 40 seconds at the default current. If you went with much shorter exposure time, of course it will give you many 
many more observations per point on the sky, but the depth of these observations would become too much shallow to do something competitive. On the other hand, if the exposure time was much longer, you would improve greatly the single visit depth, but you would have many fewer single visits. And so we think we are roughly at the sweet spot, which is 30 seconds. And this optimization and the arguments that I just laid out, they are true when you assume that all your observing time must go just to a single homogeneous survey. Now, there are caveats that if you take a <coughs> fraction of time, let's say 10% away, you can optimize it in a different way. So the, the true story is much more complex than what I'm telling you here, but there is this overarching simplicity that we do have fairly well defined optimal vacancy. <coughs> And so when photo Z's come into the plane, you start with our <coughs> task force, you assume a figure of merit, you assume you have a certain number of galaxies, and then you say, if I have this photo Z, what kind of precision will I get? How good photo Z has to be in order to get stage four experiment? And that gives you directly the limit on your limiting depth. It gives you a requirement on your limiting depth. And then you have to do optimization per band so that you know how to allocate observing time per band. And so the result of that optimization gave us these quoted limits. You should not take them literally, they are not. They are not Planck constants, they can of course vary. And indeed, photo Z performance is quite insensitive if you change any of these by few tens of time. You will see very little change in photo Z performance. But these are our fiducial values that we adopted and then, if you take M5 for a single visit, and you have this quite a it immediately tells you how many visits you have to have in total, which is about 1,000, and how you're going to apportion them per bank. So these numbers that you can also find in the SRD, they come from photo Z optimization. Photo Z is mentioned in the SRD, and I'm giving you the latest unofficial version, unofficial because it is not go to the full change control board process, the big difference in photo Z context is this red line which specifies the fraction of catastrophic outliers. Initially, it was, they were defined as those galaxies that have errors larger than 3 sigma on the sample, which in retrospect was quite stupid. And if you have very good sigma, then 3 sigma is also very good, but you call them outliers. So now we defined it as those that have errors either greater than 3 sigma or larger than 0.06. So the project science team or science council at the time did not think it through and then when people started doing actual simulations, they discovered the same <coughs> effect and they said, oh wait guys, this can be, should be improved. This is a simple thing that you missed. And yes, they missed it, but that's why we need to go to iterations to the community. So the blue square then outlines our main photo Z requirements. We assume we will see 4 billion galaxies down to this magic planet. That's what we call gold galaxy sample that will be used for high precision cosmology, cosmological studies. We hope to get our advance of 0.02. Now there are these hidden, hidden complexities of is that for every type of galaxy, is that average over some ratio range and so on. So there are, there are complex issues underlying this blue square, but that's the top level summary of what we expect to achieve. And of course, you cannot just postulate, you must get there, and this is what you're going to do, and then you plug in your inputs, you get your outputs, it's iterative process. And we did spend a few years going back and forth with the community that specializes in potency and cosmology in order to settle on these blue square requirements. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Um, so why is your error so low compared to let's say SDSS? Can you two percent? There are two reasons. One is that our optometry is about twice as good as <coughs> and I'll get to that at the end of my talk. And the other one is that LSSD is fainter, so we are probing further out to the redshift space. And then it's easier to get redshift of galaxy at Z of 1 than of 0.01. Sorry, can I? Well, while, while yeah, while yeah, while yeah. Your the workshop is. So, are these requirements um, driven by large scale structure or relenting or a combination of the two? Combination. Okay. Yeah, because basically, the and BAOs 
I don't remember about clusters, probably not. I think BAOs and Lensing that was used by Hu Zhang and Tony Tyson in their in their simulations of LSSD that would they produced at the end of the task force figure of merit. That's what, what, what was driving it. But I don't think it's very sensitive to the exact science problem. And what do we do if the universe doesn't permit anybody to write such a good virtual sector? That's what the red line serves in this slide. Excellent question. We do not guarantee this potency performance. That's what we wanted to achieve. The only thing we can guarantee is that we will give you photometry that at least in principle can deliver this photo Z. If we screw up photometry, of course photo Z is simply measuring derivative of color with respect to direction. If we screw up measurements of colors, then no matter what you do, you will not get photo Z the photos that you want from the blue square. So what we are saying is we will get you 1% photometry at the right end and whatever in this 5% at the edge of the sample of 25, 23 project guarantees people get there. But then I, I have more slides that point out, but you will need to provide calibration samples and you will need to provide algorithms that will then take our photometry, possibly other parameters like surface brightness, perhaps external information from other surveys, who knows, and produce photo Z estimates that then we will run in our data center and have to take those. Okay, so I'll ask another question. How do, how do I or Jim Koo take these numbers and convert them into photometric accuracy? That's a question about resolution of real tracks in the, in the real world, I don't mean theoretical tracks. You don't have to do it. You have the SRD that describes the data. That was so this is not, but what if they're inconsistent? I mean, this doesn't say, I mean, so what you're saying is this means nothing. The only guarantee is on the photometry. Correct. Someone has guessed that that translates into this. Correct. If that guess was bad, what? If that guess was bad, incorrect, yeah. then we have a problem. Yeah. So we promised the other, and you lot can or cannot believe this. And that's exactly how you arrived at the science requirements of Exactly. Yeah, assuming that the studies that we did together, including you and me, were correct, and that we translated correctly the blue box into photometric requirements on the survey that is specified in the SRD. Exactly. SPSS is primarily looking at low redshift ellipticals. Most of the stuff coming in here. Low redshift ellipticals are not the same as redshift one and a half of the other. These will not be easy to achieve, but we already know they're not impossible. For example, if you take templates that have some evolution in them and you believe you have complete set or interpolate somehow, you can demonstrate that photometry will be sufficient to get there. The question is really about calibration <coughs> Even methodology, even data mining, machine learning, mumbo jumbo, that's easy. It's really getting time on big telescopes and getting calibration samples. Or doing some kind of hybrid approach where you have many more bands and then you calibrate them with more sample of spectroscopic galaxies and transfer this calibration. In the same spirit, everything in that section of the SRD is just it's not as, as precise as when you look at photometric and instrumental precision. These are derived from these overall co-edit co uh, constraints, and we call it an illustration explicitly in the SLD. So there is no guarantee you will get exactly 184 visits in our way. This is what guided the design, but we reserve the right that we can optimize this before first flight and during the survey. And that's another reason to engage community. Because if you get additional arguments from the community on how we could optimize the system better, we do have tools, we are developing tools that then can tell us what to change in order to improve the science up. So these are not HP stuff. And that was the result of that optimization. So this looks very similar to SDSS bands, but we did start from scratch. It was primarily driven with what to see. There were some stellar and quasar astrophysics engaged to some atmospheric properties. So for stars, for metallic
density of stars as well as for star quasar separation, <coughs> the U G boundary is pretty much set, you don't have much freedom. These edges were designed with respect to this one micron absorption feature from and the rest basically is taking this range and dividing by four, dividing by four. Five was deemed too many, three was not enough for what <coughs> so we ended up with this filter complement that is much like it in sense. Another way of saying it is that astrophysics governs this, and for example, Jim Gunn got the same result as we did in analysis. That's why that's what's you know, they're not identical. Then we did also lots of studies about which bands to take. Do we really need new bands? At the beginning of the LSS team, and we're still in the design process, there were some other major surveys like pan stars and dark energy survey. They did not want new band. We argued we needed it. It, was, it made the, the system, the hardware, much more complicated, including both sensors and other components. And so we did a lot of studies to convince ourselves that new band really helps. And it does help a lot, not only in photo C, but also in other science, in particular stellar science. So we decided to go to UVEC. Right now, we're doing studies to see how much we can gain from W first and, uh, and uh, Euclid. This is one of the examples of the outputs that Sam Schmidt produced recently. So the top left panel shows error in photo C. And we look separately at blue and red galaxies just to see if there are significant differences. Below you can see this is the counts of galaxies in the simulated sample, blue and red. You can see that median redshift is about one or so in analysis the sample. For the gold sample, you can see, no, I'm, I was lying to you, okay. It's not, this is different, but it's not red and blue galaxies. This one actually shows the gold sample as blue and all the way to the, <coughs> no, it's really dark, okay. the red shows the gold sample and then the blue shows one magnitude brighter sample. So the red is representative of what we expect to get from core our gold sample for the analysis. So you can see that there will be some catastrophic outliers. You can the, the reason why we plot separately 24 and 25 is that at 25 we are already heavily photon limited. We have about 0.05 magnitude errors in photometry. At the edge of blue sample, we have one or two percent errors. So if you compare red and blue, you can tell how sensitive the performance is to problems in photometric precision. And so you can see that we do gain some because we have this impeccable photometry. Of course, this is yes. Um, so these tests you've done are only in the optical right? Correct. So that they minimize the probability of having gas. So that's roughly what they did. They did 
define these offsets and papers. They then ran big simulation that found what was the optimal values. Then we gave it to the engineers and they translated it to these procurement documents that we are now giving to a potential memory. So that's why our filters have slopes. They are not procured from the same memory. So let me now talk about time dependence of disease. From many quantities, we can predict how they should depend on time as you go from year one of the survey to year 10. Usually when we give performance of LSSD, we give you a 10-year performance. But of course, we want to do science in one year of LSSD, we don't want to wait for 10 years. And we can quite accurately predict what will happen in various relevant quantities. For example, if you look at the equated depth, it goes as law of t, and that's basically dependence on square root of time and the usual definition of magnitude. Here is our photo Can I ask you might want to cut the light? We don't care about stars, we don't care about stars. Discussion. These are some of the high-level things that we would like 
due to corporate and that was basically the point of meeting in Pittsburgh. We do need more work done on template facilities and other inputs to these algorithms. <coughs> we may hope that there will be new photometric regression methods developed. We need more sophisticated analysis of various effects that we didn't model to date precisely, like emission lines. Or I'll show you one very cute thing of using of using the atmosphere as poor man's spectrograph to improve the quality of photometric questions in LSSD. Just as an example of non-standard, relatively sophisticated modeling. Then there are also when we think of photometric regions, traditionally we say we get photometry, we make colors, and we fit for the best fit template and direction. But in reality, there are also stars, and optimal way to do it would be to have model selection in space of is it star or galaxy, where we also fit for SCDs of stars, where it doesn't mean photometric regions, it means photometric metallicities and effective temperatures. But mathematically, it's the same thing as you're doing with photometric regions. So you would like to have a tool that will treat both at the same time and then depending on what science you do, you marginalize over all the other quantities that you don't care about and it's statistically optimal way of doing it. We don't know if it's just mathematical cuteness when we say it's optimal or is it really matter, does it really matter for science? And so we need to simulate this and decide how we will do it eventually and that's where we need help from the community. Then there is also, depending on all these methods, we can optimize the system, we can optimize the survey. I told you this train of thought that led to the current requirements, but we are not making any statements that we are absolutely certain that we are in the optimum of possible space. It could be that we can still optimize the survey. And even if the effect is 10%, 10% of LSSD is one year of observing on 8 meter class delta. That's huge. And then we also need practitioners of photo Z to look carefully at the quantities that data management is producing that are relevant to the photometric ratio estimation and tell us if that's what we really need to do or can we improve it. And I gave you that simple example <coughs> where people pointed simple things that we did not have in our documents and we revised our documents that practitioners also want to have point estimators, not just posteriors. Simple thing, but it has to be on the books. So let me show you this little cute thing that, that basically Andy Connolly did in half an hour with this code. Sometimes you can have SCDs that produce the same colors. There are different types of galaxies. For example, it could be a red and a blue galaxy. And it just works out that these two galaxies that are very different in their intrinsic frame, they produce the same observed colors because they come from two vast different regions. That's what we call outliers. Or that's the, what we call degenerate. And so what happens is that if you now say, let me choose two galaxies where I can demonstrate that for the standard LSSD band classes, I know I will get the same colors in all combinations. UG is the same, G minus R is the same, so on. For two galaxies that have different templates and are different regions. Then you can say, but within each band, they don't have necessarily the same SCD. Just that the integral of the SCD with that particular standard band mass works out to be the same number. But the, the quantity that we integrate over is not the same. So that's basically what we do when we measure flux in LSSD. We take flux above the atmosphere, that new, and we weigh with throughput of the system that includes both atmosphere and the hardware. And so you can get the same result on the left hand side if you have two different F news. But also if you keep F new constant and this changes, you can get different results on the left. And so the idea is that because we will have in reality this quantity which is throughput of the system changing, it will be changing because different air mass that we observe through the same galaxy, different air mass. And sometimes atmosphere itself will change, its chemical composition. So there will be changing changes of the band passes that can induce photometric differences, so-called polar terms, at the level of 1 to 2 percent, sometimes even 3 percent, depends on air mass. That's what in astronomy we correct when we calibrate our data using polar terms. So these corrections, they can be different even though the integrals are the same. 
even though the colors produced in standard band passes are identical for two degenerate galaxies, these quantities, the changes of plastic respect to, let's say, air mass, they will be different. And then, of course, the question is, is it relevant? It's cute and it's mathematical cuteness, but is it really relevant for photosynthesis determination? And that's what Andy did. So basically, he generated changes of magnitudes, changes of fluxes, given changes of expected observed band passes. And he found that the entire simulation can be fairly well summarized by saying the effect is about 0 0.03 magnitudes per air mass. If you forget about the fact that even atmosphere can change, and you just say, let's postulate standard atmosphere, and just let's have observations obtained in different air masses, and let's take oxygen outputs for the air mass distributions, and then you look at this gradient, it's about 0.03 magnitudes per air mass between different templates. And so that gives you now additional piece of information about underlying SCP. So photo Z would not just be five-dimensional space of five colors. You would also have additional six quantities that would be these gradients per band pass. And of course, that's the signal to noise that you get for photo Z is way weaker for the additional six parameters than for the first five for colors. But it is not irrelevant. You can actually improve your results. And we haven't finished complete calculation, but seat of the pants estimate is that catastrophic outliers would be cut by something between few percent and 50 percent. Now, if we could cut catastrophic outliers by factor of two, by 50 percent, that would be thing worth doing. And so, someone has to finish that simulation. Just this is just an example of what we see. Working group, what useful things they could do. So let me stop here with the summary of, of these things that project things, photo C people could do to help the science of the coming here. And let me open the discussion. Okay, thanks Joko. Uh, okay, questions for Joko? Carl? So th this is a very neat method. Uh, you mentioned it doesn't include temporal variations in the atmosphere itself. Uh, and that was This was just assumed that this simulation, just to see the magnitude of the effect. In reality, we will be accounting for the changes of the atmosphere, whether it is because of different air mass or different chemical composition of the atmosphere. And actually, Robert is the leader of calibration. He can later tell you all the gory detail about what we're going to do with the auxiliary telescope. We will get spectra of stars for which intrinsic spectra we think we know, and then the changes will be due to changes in atmosphere. That's our second thing. So the plan is not to do standard astrometric, yeah. um, sorry, standard astronomical photometric calibration yeah. where we just fit a straight line to color terms. Okay. We will be doing those integrals that they show. Yeah. It's a little it's a second order that doesn't work. You don't know the photos there, you don't know the SEDs. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll use the colors, we'll use the colors to estimate an SED well enough to make the atmospheric correction. Yeah, it's second order effect, so that one comes up. More questions? Jaco, you made you made the comment uh, we better coordinate on uh, training samples because eight meter time is expensive, uh, and then never said anything again about that. So I'd like to invite you to expand on that thought because there are many missions, and in fact, I would say my feeling in Euclid is we spend all the time talking about the training sample and none of the time talking about these issues. Maybe because we don't have an atmosphere. Um, <laughs> but I do agree with you that I suspect, you know, to get your, the types of training samples we need uh, will take a global effort. I agree. So, project will have to play some role in that organization, in that coordination, but we are not paid to do so. So, we, we do understand we need to provide relevant information to people who will be pushing the coordination, but we don't have any major resources. Now, to date, not, there have been things that have been done in this direction, but there are no major programs yet. And I think that's partially because it was only a couple of years ago that LSSD was approved for construction. Now that we essentially know LSSD will happen, I anticipate over the next three to four years, 
people that start talking serious about this. Maybe they will wait for first time. You know? Remember that we need to wait for at least two to three years to tell us the speed data to get to decent processes, and we need to go to seven or eight years to get to the final performance. So there is some time to organize people. Well, Tiongko, what happens at W first or you could ask us to go to full depth over a couple of thousand degrees early, which is I think very likely. That's a different question. Well no, it means you need the good photo seeds or Zs got me corrupted. Um, <laughs> We are making the same, we don't have that time as I'm saying. saying we don't have that time. Sure, yeah. So we might have less time than I can find. Can I find um, a related question? Can you define what kind of template is set would be ideal? There are white papers produced by uh, desk photosy group. So it might have been that my presentation sounded like this is the first time we are talking about photosy. But it's not true. There is a substantial amount of work that this photosynthesis will give. And so they also have estimates of how many spectra they would need. And now that there is a lot with methods, but the, <coughs> with method. but, uh, the range is somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000 ounces, which might not sound like a very large number given that there are surveys that produce millions. However, remember, we need to go to essentially tentative magnitude to avoid the uh, training sample bias. So, so on that point, I think in Euclid, we've been discussing how to do a as clever a mapping of color space with ten points with the minimum amount of spectra, because as you can appreciate, asking for ten thousand spectra is significantly easier than asking for hundred thousand. I believe my estimate is that they bought it. They already okay. So I wonder if there's if it's does the, let's say we could get 10,000. Does the same 10,000 satisfy you who is satisfying you could it, or would 20,000 be enough to satisfy both parties? So I wonder if that's a question. I don't know. Okay, we would have to okay. sit down, look at those documents, right. see what was assumed. But the, the bottom line is it has to be a community of photosy mm -hmm. practitioners that will get yeah. together yeah. and organize. I mean, we in Euclid, we've been pushing very hard on ESO to help, and it's not happened yet, but I don't, that doesn't mean we're not going to go back and try again, so it may help to have other uh, practitioners and join. There are, there are those issues of data rights and who gets to use the calibration, you could argue relative per significant amount of European spectroscopic mm -hmm. time, and we're talking tens of millions of dollars, you could argue well, we don't want to make it public, but then the, when we put photosees in LSSD database, then it goes public for everyone. So we have this problem that might become political sticky point. There are lots of aspects of it. Yeah. Uh, I think I think there's uh, there's already fifty to one hundred thousand spectra out there for registration under the register calibration. So I think taking that out of the sample But that's then, been done. I mean right. so what what we've done in Euclid is say given what we've got, you know, how much more what's the minimum more we need? But I think things um, change with the so getting down to twenty five point three is really hard. Right? Oh yeah, but right. I think things change when moons come from. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna make I was gonna mention that. I mean, moons will come I think the, the moon's guaranteed time to really LCD joint deals. It's like twenty one minutes It's a ten point one five square degree, whatever that is. That's so right. I I went through the numbers a while ago and moon seems like a um based on
fullness of color palette. So a utopian, so I think actually it's interesting, the utopian is that the what's the cost of benefit analysis of each of these? Yes. Yes. So how much it buys you? Yes. And then how many spectra would I need in that pixel to achieve the goals that I need to, to do? So adding other photo Z uh, experiments to that is <coughs> very useful, I think. Because it could be that you could satisfy all of them with a root two more spectral. Right. Right. What's, oh. the what's the magnitude? What's the redshift the magnitude that you need to go to for you? Uh, if you're relatively sharp. Um, so in this, the the what this is the wine filter. Yeah. Uh, that's twenty four point five. And if you were doing that, yeah. uh, that, that's the source population. Yes. So that's three quarters of magnitude brighter. is somewhat urgent is if you ever did want to do something with the BLT, they're going to take um, they're going to take VMOS away in 2018. So, yeah. I think something like moons or PFS is pretty well, near IR coverage. Moons have more IR coverage. I just worry about moons. I mean, moons, uh, you know, it's going to go on the telescope and there's going to be lots of people very eager to do lots of compelling immediate science. And, and, what, and, and, you know, these, these, we've got lots of spectra, right? It's not, it's not getting the training samples for the normal galaxies. Yeah. It's well, the, it depends on the magnitude. Yeah. It, well, that's true, yeah. But, so it might be that the moons is better to push to deeper, but certainly at the brighter magnitudes, you still have these corners of color, color space that you would like to map out. As you were saying. You but LST doesn't need this until the end of year one. That is so. Year one is year not to I don't think it's year seven. I think it's extremely likely to be pressure to be part of the sky. Yeah. I mean, I think there will be what pressure. Where is the pressure coming from? But it's not going up there. There will be pressure to get that data earlier. Uh, and I, you know, uh, you click goes, launch, yeah. you yeah. goes up 2020. If we take the MLS off on in 2018, we don't have long to do this. 
sort of summary of some of the wide fields of moss spectrographs coming online from a European perspective and focusing on the um, what's coming rather than and there's actually quite a lot actually. So there's basically and I'm also going to put this in. So there's basically four, as I mentioned, summarize the technical sides. One is moons, which is on BLT. Uh, which is an optical red plus short side of the internet. So this is a Z, J, H. And then there are four optical mosses on the four meter class telescopes coming online, which are relevant uh, to us to see. One is Weed on the Hama, four meter, Desi on Ketik, which I, I think has, has relevance. And then we have four moss uh, on this side. Uh,
width is, the wavelength range is 0.7 microns up to 0.8. So that's an I band up to the end of H. The resolution, the low resolution mode is 5,000. Um, now it has 1,000 fibers, and my understanding is it's not clear yet whether failing to deploy as a thousand independent objects or you'll be taking the sky from adjacent fibers. So I think that's still to be determined whether you can simultaneously observe 500 objects, which are galaxies, for instance, uh, where you were in the sky or a thousand. It has a high resolution mode. Again, in this case, it's a uh, resolution of 8,000 calcium triplets, and then it's 20,000 in the near infrared bands. So Desi, okay, so basically, it's all here. Desi has, I'm not completely up there to date with Desi, but the design was, the whole design was 5,000 fibers, so it's the highest number of fibers of these systems. It's uh, basically and the fiber records down here. But again, I think one of the advantages of possibly is it's a different um, kind of, but of course you cannot observe, you can only observe the northern parts of the FCC field. So foremost, um, it, 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 it's broadly the same in terms of these characteristics. Um, its field of view is four square degrees, the multiplex, the foremost, is about 2,400. The observing mode is different from Weave. Weave will either observe, I think, in low resolution mode or high resolution mode. Foremost will simultaneously observe in high resolution and low resolution. Then one spectrograph is high resolution, and there's two spectrographs that both will um, operate at the lower resolution. Um, Though uh, uh, all these will be more or less designed to five year surveys. And so the foremost, our goal is that effectively we will cover the whole sky in the south. <coughs> the exposure is typically of around two, two hours per pointing. Uh, another way of looking at it, you get 75 million, 20 minute spectra. Uh, so, so this is just a like, for pointing, but when you go to a particular pointing, you're not necessarily observing always the same object. Um, although it can be a tessellation with it, so the aspect of the single point that this would just be pointed to point to the Foremost is still looking for um, uh, people to join the consortium, but to fund the, the second low resolution. ESO's baseline specification is to have a high resolution, one high resolution spectrograph and one low resolution. And so we're, we're still um, hardly looking for cash to buy the hardware on the basis that we need that to order the lead time, long lead time items and then still get uh, the manpower later. Uh, it's just uh, what it has to be the Okay, just so I've shown this in the resistance of the LC footprint. And so basically, what, what, what is the plan for going above definition zero? Formally, we need to classify in the baseline, but it's all about the definition. So I think, it's, I think it's, it's this slide here, so I'm just trying to cover here. I'll show, try to show here the fraction of the sky that the northern facilities can cover. So this is the DESI footprint. Um, Normal footprint. So basically, the DESI itself will cover possibly. Oh, so this is not in the baseline. I think DESI is um, too sort of certain, but it's optimal in the north. But there is the potential of DESI and the of getting down to minus 20, which is why I talk about the northern instruments um, as well. Okay, so just finally, just this slide, which is just to summarize. 
out one other eight meter task. Yes, I have a PFS. So PFS is, I think, interesting. The data will be published um, at some point on a very relevant time scale. It's in the north. It's, it's, a, it's a new instrument going on Mount Care. It's a 2400 fiber spectrograph uh, over a 1.3 square degree field. Resolution around 3500 with a high res, that is our high res, 5000 resolution in the red. Um, from, point, from 380 nanometers to 1.26 microns. So the big question I think on PFS is otherwise an incredibly powerful is how much time the Japanese have actually have done that. Um, but otherwise it's, a, it's got better blue coverage than blue so it doesn't go as far into the red. So for at least some of the photo Z stuff in training sets, for example, I think it's extremely valuable. So what's fiber now? 1.1. Okay. It's about right around the KSC. Um, at least the Subaru C, and you can also get fibers in that thing. 12 tons of spectrograph, that three triple that four triple specs um, on part on the IR. And the first light is nominally, we'll put it on the mountain. Start taking scientists, start putting hardware on the mountain in 2018 and start taking data in 2019. So, just to get, I guess there's two aspects to the start time is one is the frequency calibration we just discussed, okay, and there's a comment there. And then there's a sort of just general survey astronomy that would say the other 80% of the community probably can do this. So, moons, let's just try. Right. Moons obviously will be, the frequency is going to be in with Certainly with foremost, we will be doing some sort of deep surveys over um, certain, I think it's a plan to do a sort of, actually, we're going to plan for ultra deep, actually, as well. Or, or, what does ultra deep mean? Good question. Yeah. Ultra deep on PFS means 10 to 20 hours of the field. I can't remember the numbers. I have to take my time. It's probably called waves, you know, foremost. Um, which will be over 30 square degrees, um, but basically moons will be probably 50 square degrees. Yeah, I'm not completely up to date, but I get my own four wheel project scientists, but I can't keep it with an Excel. It's very hard to keep up to date. If you're putting time into your project, it's hard to keep up to date with all these things. Um, so I'll, what I might do is I'll make it, I may make it a supplementary slide that, that would capture that. Um, so the four disease, I think. Moons, a bit of a foremost will do some deep work. And certainly it's been shown with the AAT that you can do 20 hour exposures on a four meter and get, I mean, that's the positive, is it your computer is positive? Yeah, so the ball is there. The vet chopping, right? Right? The vet chopping on the fibers. Then, um, aren't they? They're putting in the process? No. They're using the sky fiber set of this. They're putting in sky fibers and science fibers. Sky down the center. That's good. It's the right thing to do. Yeah, we're not doing that calculation thing. It's too expensive. Yeah, it's it's very expensive. expensive. Yeah. We've got the sky effects in the red. Yeah. How far into the red? I, I can show you that. We should have a slide about guessing the juice kit or about the fact we are conserving the characteristics. So this, again, this, this, this is not an old slide up well. We don't want to close it. No. We can keep it. We can detect what side there. Yeah. We can keep it. We can keep it. We can keep it. Yes. 14,000. We're going to have to use all of them, right? And I think basically, then all we do 
on the Indiana field of view is 20 architects. talk about Formos after the coffee and, and I, I'll talk, talk exactly to your point. But I did want to, uh, while we, we were talking about DESI, so they did announce last, or this week, that by September 2017, they will have a call for ancillary targets <coughs> that you can ask for a few percent of DESI fibers. A few percent of DESI fibers is uh, millions. So uh, we should be thinking very hard about how one might put in target lists for DESI. DESI is going to be more. Uh, true, but it's going to overlap. I mean, you know, so a few million goes down to sub-million. It's still a, you know, a million spectra of interesting objects. It's uh, over from I know, but I, I'm picking up on... Uh, on the, you know, in, in our com in the transient community, we're used to dealing with thousands of spectra. The opportunity to pick off a few spectra per field of view. I, I think be running TAC for fibers is absolutely the way to go. Well, De but you know, Desi will be on Sky by 2019. It looks uh, very highly efficient. Uh, of course, it won't. I think foremost is the right instrument to talk about, but it, this is an opportunity that shouldn't go begging. Uh, so September 2017 is the, the deadline they will look for ideas. So you're, you're talking about the training or something? Oh, any, any, you know, any, any, if, you, if they, they're willing to give anything, you know, um, if you've got a good idea for what you could use a few daisy fibers for the field of view, then start thinking about how you're going to use it. For instance. Yeah, some training samples, transients, interesting galaxies, quasars. Oh, 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 you must, you must rip. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because you yeah. we're going to get into some of the
something that should be worked on now, which yeah. is DESI is going to take their survey of their objects for their science, yeah. and they've made a number of fibers available in that field that they are looking at. So you don't get to choose where it works, but you do get to assign some fibers. That's a very different observing problem than we're used to. So trying to say, okay, we've got all these transients or whatever it is you're interested in from the LSST data tonight, and tomorrow night we can assign some DESI fibers to some objects. We then need to know where they are looking to find where in the LSST data set there are objects that you can get a fiber onto. That's a, I mean, that's a programming problem of significant complexity, and I think it's something that very few people have thought about. Well, certainly with Foremost, we are in the discussion that a given uh, a broad set of criteria, we might be able to pick the field that they observe that night, because they, they've got a big bucket of fields on any given one night that they can observe. So of course we can't drive the telescope from over there to over there, but no, we could drive the telescope from there to there. Yeah, my point is this is very much the right time to be thinking oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, getting yeah. ready for it. We are. Whether it's a negotiation of where they look or whether it's a software optimization of what have we got where they're looking for themselves. Uh, and I certainly with foremost the, the you know the the feedback we've had, and again I'll talk about what we're gonna do after but the feedback we've got we've had is we're happy to contemplate these sorts of modes of observation, but you're going to do the work, yes. right? And that's fine, and we're yes. happy to then say, fine, we'll do the work and we'll think these things through. But the other thing I think you want to ask is how much information, if you're looking at TROs, you're going to get about a certain point in what's coming up, mobility of this particular field, probably all that sort of information that you can manage as much. There's probably more about this, but we're promising. To certainly cross people's mind, they need to give you a prediction of what tonight's field will be. It may be cloud, it may be something else. And within the human numbers, the closer we get, the more, the more accurate those predictions are. We certainly hope to make those available. So if you do have long term time, to make them available, but you cannot guarantee them. No, we can't guarantee them. No, the telescope might break. I mean, nobody sues us if it's going to break that. So, Robert, we're going to be talking about it as well. I mean, so nice. Foremost, we'll probably be in response mode. We'll take it. It's only year one. I mean, what you can do is you can, over a 10 year period, but certainly year one, I would have thought, we, we, our, our short term goal would be, would be following on transits. That. Well, what I think would be interesting to know from these instruments is what is the configuration of time. Right? So when you have a transit.
could be at the task of weeks in advance. So that, you know, their first response is to say, you want to change all your content on the time scale of a, of a week. Um, but they're very open to have that conversation to try and change it to changing OPs on the scale of a night. To change OPs on the scale of pointing maybe can push too far. But Bob, so, can, I, can I just interrupt sure. you with respect? He said no how to do TROs. They've been trying, they, they haven't managed to get their meters on as quickly as smaller and longer telescopes for gathering this. But we're not waiting all week for a register. Now, I know that there's small disruptive programs. <coughs> It is absolutely it's only bureaucracy. I'm just relaying to you when we asked about changing the where where potential you know the OBs perform us, the answer was you need to have them to us. You got the standard ESO response. But that we've got time to change that and we should change it. Absolutely. We should change the culture. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. We, we should just should respond. Just be aware an OB for foremost isn't a single fiber. It's We'll be covering the whole you know, 2,400 fibers. There's a bit of other sort of brokering that has to go on, and you have to be sure it's not going to really impact. Unless you just say that exposure drops. So you have to think about the cost well, you, you of have this observation. So you're not going to have everything in five minute response time. <coughs> Sorry, let me maybe say it this way. It ain't going to happen unless we change it. So, um, the other thing worth mentioning on foremost is while the surveys are, survey, the, for the first five years, the, the defined surveys take up 80% of the time, correct? It takes up, we get 70% and Chile gets 10%. Alright, so there is 20% so left. 20% left for the use of And that is fiber time. So, there are 20% of fiber time available for the community from 2021. So I think it is really worth thinking about what Foremost could do for LSST. I, th I think, as a community. But when you just come back to it, it's great if you put another column on that somewhere that says what is the configuration of the If you gave someone a new fiber or a new target, how long does it take to be able to do this? It's not sure that it would work to reassign the fiber, particularly on the digital.